a taste for Austin, the third live panel in our Pride and Prejudice and Zoom free virtual Jane Austen Minifest presented by the Glendale Public Library. My name is Anna Caggiano and I work here at the library. I'm a fan of Jane Austen and the organizer of this event. We have five live and three pre-recorded panels for you today and recordings of these live panels will also be available within two weeks of the event. All links and information are available at bit.ly forward slash Jane Austen Zoom. And thank you so much to everyone for being here. We encourage viewers to submit questions for our panelists in the chat. The moderator of this panel is Bianca Hernandez. Bianca, book hoarder, nerf herder, Latinx, Jane Austen fan, costumer, a social media mage by day and nerd of many fandoms by night, Bianca Hernandez is a lady of many interests. From fighting for a more inclusive Jane Austen community to ignoring her to be red pile, she's always ready for her next nerdy project. She is the co-founder of the former Drunk Austen website and currently runs the website bookhoarding.com and the Facebook group Jane Austen Universe. On weekends, Bianca can be found lightsaber fighting or slowly learning to use her new rapier. Welcome, Bianca. I'm going to turn things over to you now to introduce our panelists, but we are here if you need anything. Awesome. And with that, welcome, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to see all of the lovely virtual faces. And this panel is amazing. And I'm actually low-key fangirling over you all. Okay, so I'm going to start with some intros, but also... I'm gonna, when we get into this, you can also add any exciting things that I may have missed because this has been a long year and maybe there's some new things you wanna talk about. Uzma Jalaluddin is the author of Ayesha at Last, a revamped Pride and Prejudice set in a close-knit Toronto Muslim community. The book has earned starred reviews from Publishers Weekly, Booklist, Library, Journal, and Kirkus. Ayesha at Last was named the 2019 Cosmopolitan UK Book of the Year, long listed for the Stephen Leacock Medal for Humor in Canada, the Toronto Book Awards and shortlisted for the Kobu Emerging Writer Award. It's really good if y'all haven't read it. Like, impressive. awards are one thing, but I think we can all agree. Like, we're all gonna tell you you should read this if you haven't. <laughs> it has been heralded in bustle on so many lists by Book Riot, by NPR Code Switch, and it's been recently optioned for a film. What more do we need to say, y'all? Like, what, do we need to convince you even more if you haven't read it already? I hope you have. In addition to fix, fiction, Uzma writes a column, parent, uh, writes a culture and parenting column, column for the Toronto Star. She lives in the great, greater Toronto area with her husband and two sons. Thank you for being here, Uzma. Good to be here, thank you. So Nali Dave uh, is the author of Pride, Prejudice, and Inner Flavors and Recipe for Persuasion, which I am so thrilled people are writing adaptations of Persuasion, but we can get into that later. So Nellie's novels have been on Library Journal, NPR, Washington Post, and Kirkus's Best Books of the Year lists. She has won the American Library Association's Award for Best Romance, the RT Reviewer Choice Award for the Best Contemporary Not Contemporary Romance, multiple RT Seal of Excellence, is a Rita finalist and has been listed for the Dublin Liter Literary Award. Shelf Awareness calls her not only one of the best, but one of the bravest romance novelists working today. What an introduction. Brave, brave is usually code for stupid, but you know, we'll, <laughs> you know, we'll take what we can get, right? Yeah. <laughs> and Sonia Kamal, um, the author of Unmarriageable, Pride and Prejudice in Pakistan, Sonia is an amazing human being. So I've gotten to like work with her and been so excited to do that on the side this year. Um, she's an award-winning novelist, essayist, and public speaker. If you haven't heard her speak before or all of these lovely people, please literally go on YouTube after this and go like put their names in. Sonia is amazing. Um, she's received numerous accolades for her book, a reinterpreta uh, reinterpretation of Austin's novel in modern day Pakistan. It is a Financial Times Reader's Best Book of 2019, a 2019 selection of books all Georgians should read, a 2020 Georgia Author of the Year for Literary Fiction nominee, a 2020 Townsend Prize, a New York Public Library pick, an NPR Code Switch. Like, y'all, these books have so many accolades, but it's from the heart. These are great stories, great works, and these are great, brilliant people that we're going to talk to today. And I'm so thrilled that you're here. 
All right, so I'm going to start us off because it's November, um, and many things have happened in the 84 years since November started. But in honor of NaNoWriMo, which is this big writing um, activity a lot of people are doing, I thought we could start off talking a little bit about your writing journeys and how you got to your Pride and Prejudice inspired work or homage, however you are thinking of your book. You know, first of all, thank you, Bianca. Thank you, um, Glendale Library, for having all of us. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, with Sonali and Uzma. Um, I, you know, it's it's amazing to me always that uh, for the longest time we didn't have, a, you know, see anything really uh, from Jane Austen at all, especially with novels from our region of uh, the the world. And um, and and suddenly in the same year there were three retellings and so different in all their ways, which just goes to show how Austin can be retold, but also to, you know, to Sonali Uzma, all of us, the different ways that we interpreted it and everything. It's just, it's just like finding a whole wonderful family connected with, with Austin. Um, my journey, um, you know, I, I never meant to be a writer. There is a TEDx talk I have about why I didn't want it to be an actress, wasn't respectable. My father said no. I'd always been scribbling the way, you know, people sing in the shower. I used to write, never wanted to be a writer. But um, when I was growing up, I didn't really find anything. I grew up in the English, uh, English medium system in Pakistan, so English is my first language, and um, found books from all over the place uh, as I was going, uh, grew up in certain countries and the library shelves, but nothing in England, uh, in English uh, set in Pakistan. Coupled with that, when I was a little older, in my 20s, I came across um, uh, uh, um, the address by uh, British colonizer Thomas Babington Macaulay in 1835 to British Parliament, which actually set linguistic policy across British Empire, replacing indigenous languages with English as the official language, which then also made it the language of privilege and opportunity. And to hear the, the, the foundation, the nefarious foundation in so many ways, because he wanted to make people who were brown in color, but white in sensibility, and by dint of that confused um, people, and to hear the, the origins of, of the reason I was speaking the English language and that it is my first language was was quite interesting to me. So I wanted to what I wanted to really do, which is why Unmarriageable is what I call a post-colonial parallel retelling, is to reorient, remap, if you will, that linguistic history. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and retell um, Jane Austen with the English language I grew up in, but setting it in Pakistan, which is the culture that I grew up in. So a fusion of the two. And um, I think I think the best compliment, one of the best I've received so far is um, in Seattle uh, during my book launch there at Elliott Bay, Professor Nalini, uh, at, 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 she, she said that this was, she said, unmarriageable is Macaulay's worst nightmare. And that is, that is just, that is the best thing to have heard <laughs> per se, so. That, that's how Unmarriageable came about. Isabel? Uh, sure, I'm happy to go second. <laughs> um, so, so now you want to go? You, you, you can go if you like. That's fine. I mean, we're, we're going to do the whole like Indian Lucknow thing where it's like first you, first you, first <laughs> No, you, first you, first you. <laughs> Pele up. Um, I'll, yeah. I'll go because um, why not? Pele up. Pele. Pele me, then pele up. Go on. <laughs> so I'm happy to wait, but um, well, yeah, it's always interesting. So it is always really, really fun to be um, in a room with uh, Uzma and Sonia. We've had some fun uh, together at events and uh, I have such fond memories of it and I really, really miss it. And I wish I was there to actually give you a hug. Uh, so, journey. Um, the, the 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 really um, I think ironic thing for me is my introduction to uh, Jane Austen was through uh, a retelling. So I was probably in sixth grade, sixth or seventh. There it was. I think it was sixth grade when there was uh, an Indian TV show called Trishna. This was probably, yeah, this was, this was a long time ago in, in the days. And this is, I'm talking about India when there weren't 7,588 channels. There was one channel that played programming a few hours 
every evening and that was big because when i was really little it was a few days in a week that we actually had an hour of tv so this was when television was really really seminal in india right and so this was a tv show which in itself was like what's a tv show and uh, and it was um, a retelling a scene by scene retelling of pride and prejudice set in india and long before um Colin Firth emerged from that lake <laughs> on BBC setting off Darcy Mania. There was um, there was an Indian supermodel who was also a real life prince who played Darcy on that show. So there was much hullabaloo about this, uh, you know, about this show that was on TV, and that was kind of my um, first time watching it. And what I remembered most about it is uh, the heroine who was named Rekha, who, who had opinions, who everybody told to temper her opinions, very relatable, and who refused to do it. And here was someone who was extremely contrary, didn't really have many Fs to give <laughs> about what people thought of her, and she was loved because of it. This for me, was one of those life altering moments, right? And I was like, what is this beautiful narrative, right? So what, what more seriously what happened, I think, is that I had an internal narrative. We're all born with some sort of an internal belief. And this was one of those moments when what the world around me was telling me uh, and what was not always aligning with what I thought about myself, this was one of those moments where a story aligned with what I thought of myself. And so it was really kind of one of those things where I kind of fit in the world around me. And so I ran out and, and you know, of course, everybody knew this was a Pride and Prejudice retelling and there was much talk about it in the media. So I ran to the library and I checked the book out. And that was when I first read um, Pride and Prejudice. And I was like, what is this? You know, what is this deliciousness? This is me. And that was my first time, ironically enough, seeing myself in a book. And so um, we'll, I think we'll talk about what Austin has personally taught us all. But, but from that moment on, you know, I mean, always in the back of my mind, we were talking about journeys, always in the back of my mind. I have known that my base identity is writer. Like that has always been a part of, I, I wrote, I think before I could read and I, I, I wrote before I could, and by that, I mean, I was telling stories, writing couplets and rhyming things in my head before I did almost anything else. And, um, and so, you know, it was one of those things that I always knew in my head that I was going to do something with these stories. And then of course, as I became a writer, I knew I wanted to, you know, I wanted to do something that was different from, you know, what Trishna was back um, where my journey had started, which was a scene by scene retelling. And then in the end, what ended up was, as I thought more and more about this, there were two things I wanted to do. And one was, um, you know, that the things that I learned personally as a young person uh, that turned me into the person I am, not just the writer, I wanted to pay homage to those lessons that I had learned from Austin, which is what my stories are. They're homages to what I learned as a human being from her stories. And then the second thing was, there was just this idea that I wanted my favorite Austin novels to somehow connect, because in my head, it was all connected. You know, although they were different standalone novels, I wanted them under one story umbrella. And so that was my, wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be great dream? And so now we have Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors. We have Recipe for Persuasion. We have Incense and Sensibility that comes out next year. And then I'm currently working on Emma in Nano when, uh, doing anything but staring at the television screen. It has been hard <laughs> to meet uh, the world, world goals, but that's basically where it came from. Oh, thanks. Uh, that, was, uh, that was such an interesting answer, both uh, Sonia and Sonali. My answer is going to disappoint you because I wrote it by accident. Uh, I, didn't mean to, <laughs> I didn't mean to write a Pride and Prejudice retelling. I didn't realize I was writing a Pride and Prejudice retelling. Uh, and in some ways, uh, it, it's so interesting that the my you know that both Sonia and Sonali uh, very deliberately leaned into it, which I love. And I did that too. Once I actually realized I was doing a Pride and Prejudice retelling, until then I thought I was being an original and 
you know, charting my own course. Uh, and I was wrong, obviously, because no story is ever original, and that's fine. But um, I just knew that I wanted to write a rom-com, a happy story about my community, about uh, Indians, uh, South Asians living in Canada, specifically uh, Muslims living in Canada. And uh, the story that came out was Aisha at Last over the course of many years, because the book took me, it, it's my debut novel, it took me many, many years to write. Um, and I, I distinctly remember the idea of it coming to me as, a, you know, having this sort of Khalid character and the, these Aisha characters uh, transplanted into modern day Canada, but a part of a very close knit uh, Toronto Muslim community. Uh, so the, I remember the, the genesis of the idea, uh, but it wasn't until probably four or five drafts in when a friend of mine was uh, reading it and said, oh, Mr. Darcy. And I said, no, 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 it's my creation. And she said, no, it's Mr. Darcy, you're writing Pride and Prejudice. And I was like, oh my God, what do I do? Uh, so then I actually went back, I reread the book as, uh, as I've done almost every year since I was, since I first read it at 15. And I realized there were a lot of uh, connections between uh, what was turning into Aisha at last and Pride and Prejudice. And I decided to really lean into it because there's a lot of inherent humor in Austin uh, that translates really well to, um, you know, very conservative or traditional type of communities. Uh, so uh, that, that's why there's a lot of Austin references in Aisha at last. There's also actually a lot of um, a lot of Shakespearean references in Aisha and Last uh, as well. So a little bit of both, but I, it, it, it was uh, subconsciously inspired by Austin, I guess, by accident, a happy accident. I'm, I'm thrilled that it turned out the way it did. Hard to get her out of her heads, right? Yeah, <laughs> I think so too, yeah. I exactly have a it. bonus question and not, you don't all have to answer if you don't want to. Any tips on writing Mr. Darcy, one of the most iconic, you know, heroes in <laughs> literature? How much time do you have? <laughs> I mean, they say that we only have so much time. So maybe this, this will become a separate thing. But I'm just curious if you have any tips for folks. I know for I me, mean, <laughs> okay, oh, this the starting up thing means you first very politely, in very polite terms. It's like, you go first, you go first. And the joke is that there were two people waiting, two men waiting for the train to get on the train. And by the time they finished the first two, first two, the train had gone. So, so yeah, I think for me, the most important thing when I was doing, um, when I was writing my Miss, you know, my Valentine Darcy was um, that I needed him to be in, you know, it's set in contemporary Pakistan. And there's no reason my Elizabeth Bennett, Alice, who has a job and is working would need to marry anyone she doesn't want to per se. So I needed to him to make him really attractive. And for me, an extremely attractive quality is a guy who write, uh, who reads and can discuss books and stuff. And Alice is a um, English literature school teacher. So I gave him that particular characteristic in order to appeal to her directly. But also I needed him for me, it was very important, you know, in, in Pride and Prejudice, uh, the way Austin, I believe, has written him, Darcy is very snooty. He is from the, you know, the upper echelons and stuff. Um, in fact, one of the things is Wickham in her novel is the manager's son, and there's a class thing there. And I absolutely wanted to rewrite and, and retell that particular class uh, frame. So my Wickham is uh, my Darcy's cousin, so that they're from the same family. So it's not their professional background or class background, which might be responsible for their upbringing, but their um, personality. And by dint of that, I wanted uh, Darcy to not be snooty per se, but to actually be very much put off by sycophants and people who kiss his ass because he's Mr. You know, rich and everything. So those two traits were very, very important to me to give to him because they are what I believed would appeal to my, Elizabeth, my Alice in him. And I always um, kind of think of characters, not just Darcy, um, any character as, uh, you know, as what is the essence, right? As a writer, that's kind of what you're trying to, what is the essence and what is the thing, what is their journey, right? What, are the, what, what is the thing that takes them from not, not having what they want to, to, to reconciling with what they have or getting what they want. And um, also Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors is a gender swap. So this is a really interesting question for me. She is the Mr. Darcy and he is the Lizzie Bennet. And there's a very specific reason for that. I think one of the things, and, and what I love that Uzma said, uh, and what I love about these three books is, um, is as Uzma said, they're happy books, right? And, and I feel like there is a distinct lack of 
joyous, happy books in brown, specifically South Asian Western literature, right? Where it's 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 all poverty porn and pain porn, and um, and these oh, books or or, te or terrorism if you're from a certain part, which of is all pain porn, right? Exactly. Which is basically yeah. how horrible our lives are, and our lives are not horrible. I am very you know, sorry and happy to inform everybody, but the point is we rarely wake up in the morning, look at ourselves in the mirror and bemoan how sad it is to be a brown person. Um, <laughs> we kind of don't do that. And all of our books are basically us doing that. And so I love the fact that our books are just really happy books. And if you ever meet the three of us, 90% of our conversations are laughter, you know? And so it's kind of really, um, a thing that I specifically wanted to do. But with that, I think comes the question of privilege, right? Uh, because also, you know, porn and uh, not porn, but poverty porn. Is, <laughs> I just said that word so many times. And Ali Freudian slips <laughs> apparently say a lot. <laughs> Next question. But coming back to turn. this one, I, you know, I, I think that, yes, there is that place in our literature for obvious reasons. So when we think about happy stories and the fact that three, three of us are specifically those people, the question of privilege in brown communities and privilege in immigrant communities comes about. And I think a lot of Austin's explore, explorations at class, which is just another way of saying exploration of privilege and the lack thereof, right? And so I especially feel like the Darcy and uh, Elizabeth story is a story that is an exploration on class, right? And so there were two things. One was that when you're trying to create um, a Mr. Darcy-esque character, what he is at his essence is someone who is 100% comfortable with his privilege. He completely owns his, um, his gifts, right? He doesn't question them, you know, and, and he, he has moved from that point to the point of doing the best he can with it. So he's very, very comfortable with his privilege. But he is a darn jerk as a result, result of it when we first meet him. And as a, as a woman who writes, um, you know, who writes women and writes about female agency, we have all heard um, this discussion about women characters and likability, right? The first thing when you write a, a female character, uh, that the editors, readers, everything, the, the focus becomes, you know, how the, the smile more conundrum, right? The likability becomes such a big thing. And yet one of the greatest romantic heroes of all time is Mr. Darcy. And when we meet him for the first time, he's a darn jerk, right? So we give him so such a long, uh, such a, you know, long birth. And so even today, so writing this book in 2018, I, I kind of wanted to examine that, that, you know, can I today write a woman who completely owns her privilege, never apologizes, apologizes for it, you know, buys into her own awesomeness and has moved on to the step of trying to do some good with it, which comes with all the, with the journey of, you know, self realization that Darcy goes through. But but I will say that I think as, uh, as the experience of writing a character, it was completely life altering for me. I actually started to question everything I did, how I thought about myself, how I presented myself, how hard I worked to be likable in the home as a domestic person, as a daughter, daughter-in-law, mother, wife, all of that, right? So there was so much of that that happened. And, and I think that that's the, you know, that for me was what was important about writing Mr. Darcy, which is, you know, writing her as a female. And, and I think when you're, you know, what is it that you're trying to do with this character? Because Austin did what she did with her character, but at one point these become our characters and what are we trying to do with it? I think that's my biggest tip. Yeah, that, those are both such great answers. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep my answer short. Um, once I decided to lean into writing the Mr. Darcy character, uh, I, I think when I first started writing it, it I was tickled by the idea of trying to make um, my Khalid look uh, attractive because he is, um, he's a very obvious stereotype. He's a, he, you know, he, he walks around, he dresses, he's, he's a very, um, uh, what's the word? he's a very observant Muslim man. Uh, and he dresses the part in the same way that sometimes Muslim women uh, are dressed apart. Like I'm, I'm wearing hijab and there's lots of conversations about women and hijab and Muslims and things like that. But Khalid, on the other hand, he dressed apart in like, he looked like an extra from Homeland. You know, he had like the long white robe and like the, the skull cap and like the long beard and things like that. And I was like, I am, I'm gonna make him sexy. I'm gonna make uh, people fall in love with him. And how hilarious would that be? Because ultimately I'm writing satire. And I think so much of Jane Austen is satire, but 
how do you make someone like that attractive to people? Um, you have to really lean into the haters and uh, haters to lovers trope, right? So you make the two characters at complete polar opposite ends from each other. Uh, Aisha is a feminist. She uh, she has she has agency. Um, she she has very specific ideas about how she wants to live her life. Uh, she's not very traditional. She doesn't really have the sort of parental input that uh, a character like Hala does. Uh, and then Khaled, on the other hand, is like a glorified mama's boy who can't stand up to an overbearing mother who even tells him who to marry. Uh, and yet, he, because he has that core sense of tenderness inside of him where he wants to take care of people, he wants to take care of his mom, even though she's insufferable. She wants to take care, he wants to take care of his sister, even though she's been banished to another country. Uh, and so I think, you know, kind of, and then on top of that, having this sort of gruff exterior where uh, just like Mr. Darcy was so... Um, misunderstood by a lot of people because he didn't know how to present himself. He didn't know how to talk. And someone like Khalid is like that too. He keeps putting his foot in his mouth. He, but he's, we know because it's a dual uh, perspective uh, novel that at heart, he's, he's a good person. He's a tender person. He's very romantic. So I think that's what you have to lean into if you want to write a Mr. Darcy character, really sort of break down what makes Darcy so damn sexy. Uh, and hey, you could even turn, like I turn and uh, uh, an extra on Homeland into, into uh, the main love interest, which, you know, where's my gold star? <laughs> I really like that a, a lot of you were touching on, I think something that's really important, I've talked to Stonia before around, um, you know, diversity in these spaces, as far as just like communities that are represented in Austin-esque or Austin-related things. Um, and it also, Sonali, like your discussion, you, you talked a little on something that is really important to me, which is the lack of joy that we see in writing about, you know, BIPOC communities. Um, and thinking about that too, I, I've seen that a lot of people re have responded to your books with like, they're very relatable. And I think it's really great when, um, you know, the communities that you're writing for see themselves reflected in your work because it's like, I've finally been seen by somebody. I'm finally centered in but, this work. But, but you know, the interesting thing is, it's not even just the communities that you're writing for, because I don't think I was really writing for any community. I was just writing the book I wanted to write, mm -hmm. like I do with anything I write, be it essay, be it the other, another novel, be, you know, my first novel, whatever. I write what I want to read. What, what's been so wonderful for me on two aspects is that I do tend to write about more, you know, my first novel is about gang rape, and it is about terror and it is about immigrants, it's set in, in, in immigrant US. And it's all the tropes that um, we tend to see, but it's not why I wrote it. It's, it's not from a religious perspective, it's from an ideal, idealism perspective. What do you do, you know, if you're, if you're idealistic like Superman and Spider-Man per se, and you know, so that sort of stuff. So, so it was interesting, you know, for me, because Unmarriageable was my post-colonial project, so to speak, to, to, like I said, reorient linguistic history, Therefore, I, for me, it wasn't ever a sequel, prequel, mm -hmm. taking an idea and going with a character or anything like that. I, I always knew that if I do this, and I was very, I will, you know, if I do this, and I was intimidated because of, of exactly what I wanted to do, which was write a, what I call a parallel retelling, which is perhaps like Krishna, liter literally, it follows the plot um, of Pride and Prejudice and um, and all the characters in Pride and Prejudice, Prejudice are there. I mean, and then, you know, I've given the five sisters their own their own personalities. I've brought a lot of new characters, everything. But this is this is Pride and Prejudice. And what, another wonderful thing that I had not ex except, expected was, um, you know, Jainites. Because I, I did wonder once, you know, what Jainites would think. And for them, a lot of the, a lot, you know, they, they tend to really like it because they feel like they're reading Pride and Prejudice for the first time because of that. And, and that in itself has been, you know, the fact that and then a lot of people you know readers tell me that they that you know they'll say th this is a book completely set in Pakistan there's no immigrant story in this there's you know it's completely 100% set in Pakistan so for readers from you know the American South uh, Jewish readers Russian readers Norwegian Indian readers you know from all over the world will write to me or tell me that this is just like us this is like my family and I'll tell you that is extremely gratifying because I feel that that with Unmarriageable, with um, Aisha at last, with Pride and Prejudice, and with Sonali's, you know, Persuasion, subsequent books, what I think these joy, the joyous is wonderful to have, I guess I bought the heavy bit in to say I never meant to write a joyous book, because it's a parallel retelling, I have written one with a happy ending, and as a writer, I cannot tell you how amazing it is to have written a joyous book, and see, and see what it is to have a book that bought 
tears of grief to people and then have another book that brings tears of joy. It's been very interesting. But but just that I, what I love about all three of our books also is that they provide, you know, a lot of us, like I said, have grown up by dint of British Empire, whatever, reading books by British authors, American authors, etc. And find and learning to find learning to see ourselves through the thematic content, if not the characters. And now there's something that is able to allow people from different parts of the world to do the opposite. And that connectivity and that universality, which perhaps all three of us have grown up with, to be able through our three novels to offer that in reverse and say, come, let us take you into our world where you will see that they're, they're just like your worlds too. And that, that has been, you know, the, the, a wonderful gift. And, and even with, you know, there's no single story. So even within our community, be it Sonali's, you know, Indian, Hindu, uh, very rich uh, characters, be it Uzma's Canadian immigrant Muslim characters and stuff, even when I've read their two books, for me, it's like I'm, I'm discovering new spaces, dif discovering new ways that South Asians live and breathe and are happy and stuff. Um, because there's no single story. We are not one monolith, which is why our books are so amazing, because they're each are different, and they'll offer you a different window into what it means to be South Asian, Muslim, Hindu, whatever. So, so you know, that has been wonderful. Yeah, and certainly, I think not being a, being a monolith is is the most universal thing across all cultures. But I think that that thing where I mean, I used to be amused when people came to me and and told me how relatable my books were, and that has always been a very complicated word uh, when you're in this advocacy space for more space for brown stories and stories that are not you know, what they have traditionally been um, in the Western world um, as, a, as a majority. But, but having said that, I mean, you know, emotion is relatable, right? How we love our children, how we're loved by our parents. There is, you know, I mean, this is, that being said, it's, it's also interesting to me how there will be this textural difference in, um, in how certain relationships in my books are consumed, right? So there is in Pride, Prejudice and Other Flavors. So this is also, um, you know, the story of a politically ambitious Indian American family in the, in the Bay Area, and they're descended from royalty. And some of that comes from the fact that I was fascinated by Indian royals and what happened to them through colonization and how, you know, how they've translated their noble blue blood through a changing history. And that all of that fascinated me. So I wanted to play with that. But also because I was specifically um, trying to explore privilege, right? So I was actually finding ways, um, you know, to pile up almost as much privilege as I could purposefully on this family so I could examine it and examine how those characters and that cl those class differences work today. So while it is joy, it is also a lot about that. But, but interestingly enough, when it comes to the texture of the actual relationships, there will be times, so they're, they're the patriarch of that family, they call, the kids call him HRH, which stands for His Royal Highness, not to his face, but they call their father HRH behind his back. And, um, and he's very much HRH. And so, uh, you know, because all of these kids also, along with their privilege comes some of the, um, the South Asian community, high achieving, um, you know, expectations and all of that also. But so I have this father who is very much uh, a, 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 an autocrat, um, but, but who believes himself to come from a noble place. So while he is an autocrat in terms of, um, you know, being having his expectations be absolute, he is also a character who has been focused on assimilation, right? Because he wants political power and somehow political power in this space comes with needing to assimilate. And so there's all of that also going on, but I will have readers um, who will come to me uh, who are from the Indian community who find HRH completely relatable. Like, you know, what's not to get, you know? And they don't hate him because he is everyone's dad in some way. And, um, and, and white readers have a really hard time with this man. They are like, what a horrible, horrible father. Like, why do these kids put up with him, right? And I'm thinking, like, I'm not understanding why he is so horrible to you. Of course he's horrible because, you know, I'm, you're, I'm also always, kind of using the father characters in my books to be a metaphor for patriarchy in general. So they become my tool to explore that. 
but but the way so there's also this lovely way of seeing um you know the relatability but the you know the, the the more silent parts of culture and how people tend to see you know although i feel like i have seen white fathers who are a lot like hrh through you know in western literature in movies today in in my neighbors homes and yet you know this putting putting it in this garb suddenly makes it like you know this this almost exotified separating experience so there's a lot of you know lot that happens and um, and and it's it's fabulous i think to bring it up to the surface so i was actually going to oh yeah yeah no 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 you didn't I, even I, ask I, a question say, Bianca, 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 go ahead like yeah <laughs> no this is brilliant because i was actually inspired by some of the conversations that i've heard a lot of you having before because i i listened to some of your interviews and you so now you touched on the exact thing that I'd want to ask you about this whole relatability and how there's a little bit of just like complexity and how you feel about that when people talk to you about that um it, and I'm also curious about like you touched a little bit on the exotization and I think too I'd seen an interview with um Sonali and um Sonia where you talked about how people are always talking about like food, food in your books is such a big deal. And I totally, you know, I totally, I think there's a couple of ways that we can think about that. I, and I, I think that a lot of people find, you know, find symbolism there that is there, maybe it isn't there. Um, but I'd love to know, especially because a lot of writers of color can often feel like this focus on food in their writing can make them feel like there's a little bit of exaltation happening. And I would just love to know, you know, as a reader, you know, to me, the forefront wasn't food much as a food adjacent things. Like family is the forefront of these conversations. Food happens to be there or they happen to be in the kitchen having this discussion. So I'm curious how you all feel about this discussion and when people come in are hyper focused on the food in your work. You know, I hadn't even realized. I've really surprised. Sorry. No, sorry. No, go, ahead. go on. Uh, oh, uh, okay. Sure. I, I was actually really surprised at how many people were interested in the food in my book and so many people said that my my uh, eyeshot last made them hungry uh and and I, I was sort of taken aback I guess because food is just it, it's not that I'm obsessed with food or that I'm a particular foodie but I think a lot of our a lot of my cultural upbringing has like a lot of uh, family events revolve around food you know like we make special food for Ramadan or we'll make special food for uh parties and and things like that and it, just the description of that food just came very naturally to me and what I noticed, um, uh, and I really leaned into this, uh, there's a couple of scenes in my book that really revolve around sort of passing the tradition of how to make like a barata uh, flatbread to the next generation. And, uh, but but I, I also use it as a way to sort of deconstruct some of the um, assumptions that are made about uh, people from the community because it was, it's Khalid, it's the male character, the Mr. Darcy who loves to cook. And in fact, his mother is a terrible cook uh, and he finally, at the end of the novel, has a has the courage to tell her that. Um, but he's the one who secretly cooks, and he he kind of uh, brings food for Aisha, and it's a way that he sort of woos her because she can't cook either. Uh, so he learns a recipe from Aisha's grandmother, and it's a real bonding moment for them. I do think there's a bit of a critical uh, a criticism about this in food. Uh, I know there's been literature written about this and how. Um, sort of sharing this food and, and using food as a way into other people's culture as a way of consuming other people's cultures. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm kind of of mixed opinions about this because, of course, I, I live in Toronto, uh, in Canada, and Toronto has a super foodie culture, and I, I really enjoy, you know, sort of sampling all the dishes around me. But on the other hand, I, I, I'm, it does make me feel a little bit uncomfortable um, on some levels. That being said, my second novel, which is publishing this spring, it's called Hanathon Carries On. Uh, is a foodie romance and in fact it was just featured in an article on Publishers Weekly just yesterday uh, about all the foodie romances that are coming up. It's literally set in uh, two rival halal restaurants uh, and one focuses on Indian cuisine and another on you know sort of American cuisine. So I guess um, I'm sort of leaning in. I also love food. Uh, yeah I don't know. I'd love to hear what the, everyone else thinks. You know, I didn't realize I was writing about food until so many people started telling me, asking me questions about food and asking about the food in the novel. Um, and I think partly because I don't give any recipes or anything. So my, my focus was not to bring food. I, I don't, I didn't bring food into the novel because, um, because I like food or anything. I do. But I think for me very much it was, um, 
you know, food, especially in the domestic uh, spheres, often becomes the tool through which women compete, so to speak, you know? Um, and a lot of times, who, who is cooking in that household? Who can cook? Uh, what, uh, what sort of cook you are? How many dishes you can cook? But it also, at least in Pakistan, shows a socioeconomic level. And that very much paralleled with Austin's um, Pride and Prejudice also, because that wonderful scene, which is, I remember when I was first reading Pride and Prejudice at age 16, and for me, it was automatic, you know, the, the first time I read it, I was like, this is a Pakistani novel, Jane Austen is Pakistani. She didn't know it, Pakistan wasn't created then, but but this is just, and that's the spirit I read it in because all those people were around me, all those, but one scene I remember that just leapt out to me and I was like, and made me feel that way was um, when Mr. Collins has come to the Bennetts for, for dinner and he asks, you know, about which, to which of my uh, fair cousins do I owe this meal? And Mrs. Bennett says very snootily, we can keep a cook, you know, because, because for her, the affront is that he has misjudged their class, right? They can afford to keep a cook. They, none of her daughters have to so-called sully themselves in the kitchen. And, um, and that just leapt out at me because that was for me quintessential Pakistan. Who, who has a cook? Who doesn't? Whose daughters, you know? And in Pakistan, like with the upper class, if you know, you, you learn to bake a cake or whatever, but you don't really learn to make a meal to, you know, feed. So, so much of that. And, and I wanted to showcase a lot of that, or at least it just happened to come up in Unmarriageable. Um, there's a, one of my favorite scenes in Unmarriageable is where um, uh, my Charlotte's uh, mother and Elizabeth's mother are fighting in front of Mr. Collins. They're quarreling about whose daughter will be less likely to be divorced, the one who can cook or the one who can give good orders to the cook. So, you know, so that's how food came into my novel a lot. Um, and I do think, for you know, for me, the, what, what was my bottom? For me, I mean, when I, food is a huge connector. It just is. It's one of those universal things which we all do, regardless of weight, size, shape, culture, whatever, country, faith, we all eat. And, and, and so that is almost, and, and by dint of that, the ingredients we tend to use are all the same, right? There's bread, there's soup, there's, there's wheat, there's rice, there's this, for those of us who have to stay away like me who, and I'm going red because of health issues, but you know, stuff like that. There's so much relatability there. So for me, often books with chef food in it, I can relate to them at some level, right? And for me, it does make me hungry. I'm, I, for me, and I want to then go out and try that food and stuff. And so I, the whole thing about consuming a culture through food, I, I'll think about that. I, you know, I, I, I know a lot of people who've read Unmarriageable and they've, you know, asked for uh, Pakistani restaurants and Pakistani food and stuff. And I, I, I think it's a good consumption maybe in this respect. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's amazing how all three of us never, with our debuts especially, never set out to write a book about food, but have repeatedly heard. So, so my first book is, um, you know, is, is a over the top Bollywood style romance novel um, on one hand, but it is the story of a child bride, um, you know, who, who, who finds um, finds her way out of that marriage, and uh, but it is it is this over the top Bollywood esque rom com, and um, it had it had a hero who who cooks and who likes to cook, and there isn't I mean there is some food in it, but it had I hadn't even noticed that there is food in it. And one of the single constants in all the reviews was don't eat this don't read this book hungry right be be prepared with the phone number of your closest um indian restaurant like food 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 flavor food porn like that and and i was i was a little taken aback you know it was one of those things where you know you suddenly kind of are in a room full of people and you think you are just who you are and someone will say something and it suddenly reminds you Oh, to them all, I am a Indian person, right? And so suddenly there is this mirror. It's like being in this room and you look in a mirror and you suddenly realize like you're not like everybody else. And it is this really strange experience. And it was, it was to me um, this little pointing out that this is not like all the other romance novels that we read. There is, you know, and so almost like someone was specifically going out looking for a different show. And that I think is, you know, to me was a little stunning. 
but it's not that simple, right? I mean, in my life, um, food is extremely important. And I mean that as a means of showing affection, as a means of celebration, as a means of so many things that are emotion related, right? And um, I, I mean, today, right, uh, we were, you know, let's open a bottle of wine for lunch, right? <laughs> that's that's about consumption. And so I, I realized that I'm also naturally and automatically using it as a device to display. And that's why my hero was, uh, so two things about heroes who cook, again, across the board, um, you know, we all have written, uh, because we're trying to tell a man or we're trying to rewrite Sometimes men to be nurturing. We want men to be nurturing and, and food is, you know, food is a way. I mean, that's why so many people get hurt in novels and fall sick because you can in any, you see a human being when they're taking care of someone else. And so you see a human being when they're feeding someone. And so then I became a little less defensive and pride, prejudice and other flavors. I think, you know, I mean, there the hero is the hero's love language, the hero's only way of expression. His art is his food because he's a chef. And so I almost then took it and became facetious with it. I'm like, I'll give you food. Here you go. And so, you know, Pride Predators and Other Flavors is that. It is in your face a foodie novel. And if you don't come out of it and order um, takeout, I'm going to be offended, right? And so it's almost like this thing where your own relationship with your writing and what you're trying to say and how you say it grows. And I will tell you a funny story that may be a little inappropriate, <laughs> Bianca, is my son was, uh, you know, for a short time going out with a girl who was Latinx. And, uh, you know, how instantly uh, stereotypes form, right? Their friend, I'm overhearing these children who are in their, you know, who are young adults talking. And they're like, can you imagine that wedding, the food, the dancing, you know, and so automatically, you know, these, these kids who are a mix of all these races are saying, here is an Indian person and, a, you know, and a, and a Mexican American and an Indian American. And when they come together, that wedding is going to have the best dancing and best food. This is just automatically things that are projected even by, um, I mean, I just feel like, and, and, you know, it's, I mean, any kind of preconceived notion is always bad, but it's also the human condition. So, you know, it's, um, I, I travel the world consuming other people's food, you know, with the express desire to eat food that is outside of my experience. And I think that, that how you look at it and intention is always also relevant. I mean, I, I've also found it very fascinating in, in the US and in terms of the US and in my first novel, actually, an isolated incident, food doesn't come up at all. It just comes up once or twice. There's no really food in that novel. It has, place, <laughs> it has no place in that novel thematically, etc. cetera. But, but, but there is a little bit of dialogue between um, two of the characters in there where they're going planning to order food. And so they say something like, should we order, you know, Greek, Mexican, you know, they take country names, uh, you know, to order these these particular cuisines. And I've all, you know, Greek, Mexican, Indian, Pakistani, um, you know, Japanese. And I've always found that particular labeling very interesting um, as to how so much of, um, you know, how with food, that particular bringing that particular labeling is okay and what that means in so many instances and where the nuance of, you know, we're having, we're having Mexican tonight or we're having, you know, a, a, a Japanese dinner tonight, you know, stuff like that. Those particular phrases and stuff, which are so ubiquitous over here. And those have really interested me um, because sometimes you will find people who are not very, you know, who don't know, who, who might not want cultures in their homes in so many ways, and yet in their dinner table and what they are consuming is very much every night a different night based on a different country and that country's cuisine. So um, it's interesting. We are almost out of time and I had so many more questions for you all, but you are amazing and I could not interrupt you because it would break my heart. I have one lightning round question and then I will maybe ask a question from the audience. What do you consider the food of love? Hmm. Are you asking us first? Fine. Okay, I'll go quickly. And for me, the food of love is the food of comfort. And it's what you would eat when you're grieving or you're sad or you're whatever. And for me, that is love. Um, oftentimes I have an essay about um, food and this particular question actually in the New York Times, it's called Plating Memory. And oftentimes when I'm missing, my, my, my parents live in Pakistan, etc. I'm gonna cry. Often when I'm missing them and stuff, I, I'll make the food that 
I've grown up eating with them. And for me, it's uh, by sharing, by eating that food, I feel as if they're there for me. And I had a very bad miscarriage many, many years ago. And um, I didn't know anyone. I'd recently moved to Georgia. And this is what the essay is about. Someone bought me enchiladas. I'd never really had enchiladas before. And at that time, I didn't really like them. But, you know, I, I, I kept them in the fridge forever because that was the food of love for me. Someone I didn't really know bought that dish for me. They, they put their time, their money, their expense, their thought into it. And that's comfort and that's love and that's welcome. So that's what the food of love is for me. Sonali, I think it's chai for me, drinking tea. I know it's not really food, but there's something about the act of uh, drinking. Yeah, yeah, drinking, drinking yeah. tea, uh, specifically tea. It's a very South Asian drink, um, though of course in North India, they love their coffee. Uh, sorry, South India, they love their coffee. Uh, but yeah, just the act of uh, whenever I go visit my parents, uh, I'm fortunate my parents live about uh, five, uh, five minute drive from me. So the first thing they ask me is, do you want some chai? And we'll all sit down and we'll have, uh, you know, it's nothing fancy. It's literally a tea bag in hot water with some milk. We call it chai. Uh, but that, that's how we catch up. We drink chai and it's the conclusion of every meal. And there's, there's just the good memories associated with the brewing of, sharing of, and drinking of the tea. Yeah, yeah chai for me is the food of waking up <laughs> because you don't want to meet me if I haven't had my morning chai. But I think for me, again, this is like such, it's so speaking of who we are and what, what point in our life we're at, right? Because today, uh, you know, with my, the length of my to-do list and who I am today, any food that someone else makes for me is my food of love. Don't make me make it. I mean, I still do, but, but, but I think it is just such an act of love to like, I, just before this, I was at a friend's house and she was like, we just made Jambadaya when come over because she knows I'm doing work comes right now. You know, and what could you could, she could have fed me boiled dal and rice, which by the way is one of my favorite things, strangely enough, but yeah, just the, the act of feeding someone. You know, yeah, and for me today, that's the, you know. You know, for me, since I'll just bring chai up, chai is a friend. Chai is, even if I'm not drinking the damn thing, I will make a cup and I will put it next to me. And it's just there all day long. It just is. I'm constantly, even if I don't, seriously, don't touch it. It's a habit. It's really, a, it's a friend. Um, and, and uh, you know, and I have an essay about this also, but please, chai means tea. So there's no chai tea. <laughs> Please don't say that around us, especially. We should all say it together. One, two, three. Chai don't tea. 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 <laughs> so just say chai. I don't need to say chai tea. So public yeah. service announcement from the three of us. So if we walk away with anything, let's make sure that we remember that. I think so someone asked that in the, the, in, the, in the questions, I think. So I figured I'd yeah, ask It's that. just tea. Hot water and milk and tea. Yep. Amazing. I know, I know Sonali that... takes a lot of sugar in hers too. No, not at all. No. So, so there's this complex. Mm -hmm. Chai is also, I think, always complicated for us, right? So I have a, it has to, like if it, it has to have ginger. And then uh -huh. I have this thing where, you know, as soon as you put sugar in my chai, I won't touch it. Um, but if it's a particular kind of boiled Gujarati masala chai, mm -hmm. then I'm okay yeah. with that sugar. That needs sugar. That's yeah, you have to have sugar in the masala and, chai. Yeah, yeah, and I agree. And with Pakistan, I think the only masala or the only spice you'd ever put in tea is cardamom. So my best friend yeah, is from Lechi. India. And at the first time I went to her house, <laughs> she opened the fridge, took ginger out, and she literally started grating ginger. And then she put oh, something yeah, yeah, else. Yeah. And at this point, I began to ask her, I was like, are you going to put chilies and oil in this too? It's tea. <laughs> and I know that that's one masala tea, right? Spice tea. Otherwise, yeah, tea yeah. is just like, you know, for me also, it's, it's hot water, you know, the, the tea bag or loose tea and, and milk on top um, if you're not lactose yeah. intolerant, which I am. So it's just make that damn tea, put it there. Hello, friend. <laughs> so yeah, we, we, we consume, um, I think, half of Costco's, um, you know, ginger section in this. The big, the big, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you all so much. I think we could be here for hours, but I'm so glad that we got to spend a little time on this wonderful, wild November day chatting about wonderful books and wonderful people. Thank you so much. 
Well, thank you, Bianca. And again, it's it's such a joy always to be with Sonali and Uzma anywhere. And I hope, you know, once all this is over, I hope we can meet in uh, public again. And I can, I like to tease everyone and both of them in particular. I feel very sisterly about that. <laughs> Elderly, <laughs> elder sisterly. So if you hear a lot of the bantering, it's because we know each other a lot and um, we're just comfortable saying whatever <laughs> to each other. So. Definitely. Yeah, this awesome. is fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you, you all so for much. attending. Thank you so much for coming. This was great. And um, next, uh, our, pa our next panel is um, A Daily Dose of Jane, the Austin Antidote for 2020 with the one and only Devaney Lozer. So hope you all are tuning in for that. And thanks again. This was so great. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.